Hey everybody, JK and Ferdinand here from Animator Island. Today we're going to talk a little bit about your favorite topic, Frozen. Now I know there have been a million discussions on Frozen as it is, but there are a few reasons why we're doing another one. Firstly, it's been a wildly successful film, and because of that, it really needs to be talked about uh, ad nauseum because we need to learn everything we can about why it was so wildly successful. Also, Frozen, well, it had some flaws. Flaws that the masses kind of glossed over, but we really want to look at as filmmakers, because as filmmakers, we want to make the greatest film that we possibly can. So you ready to do this, Ferdinand? All right, let's do this. <laughs> Okay, so first I want to talk a little bit about the opening. <sighs> the opening to Frozen, featuring a bunch of ice cutters cutting ice, uh, it didn't really sit well with me. First of all, the animation was kind of just iffy at places. Uh, I didn't feel like they captured the full weight of ice. And what disturbed me most, I think, was here was a very young Kristoff and Sven out cutting ice with these ice cutters, when that is an extremely dangerous situation. And we don't really get any idea of where are Kristoff's parents? Uh, why is he out there by himself and have a little sled with this tiny reindeer? It just, it didn't really seem to fit well. You know what I mean? And later in the film, the, like completely, it doesn't matter who those guys are and they are not his family, it turns out. Apparently. So, what, what? But, I, I mean, I, I also heard that like a lot of people really like that part because it's it's kind of epic and it has Lion King music and it, it does. Lion King crossed with Pocahontas crossed <laughs> a little bit of Brother Bear for good measure. Uh, it felt like it was epic for the sake of being epic. It was like we need an opening so let's make it amazing and it won't really have to do with anything. Now you could argue that it introduces Kristoff and Sven but I don't know that that's the best introduction for them because it doesn't tell anything about them. It just shows them on screen and it doesn't say why they're really there. Like, if, if his parents are dead, which we can assume because later in the film we've learned he's raised by trolls, uh, then shouldn't you really kind of explain that? Or is there like an uncle alongside here that that's why he's learning this trade? And, and how old is he? He's got to be like six or something, right? Yeah. So... I don't know, it just seemed really disconjointed with the rest of the film to me. And also, I mean, if like everything turning to ice is the twist of the story, it's kind of weird that they, I mean, the movie is called Frozen, but why would they start with what is the problem which only will appear later in the film? I feel like it mm, does not make sense for telling us anything, because it doesn't. Yeah, it was, it was a rather strange opening in my opinion, but nevertheless we continue on and, and uh, are introduced to our two main characters, Anna and Elsa, uh, and then that part seemed to work decently well. We, we learned that Elsa has powers and, um, and then the interaction between Anna and Elsa in those moments really set up the rest of the movie, which is all about you know the two sisters and how they used to be close, but now they're not close anymore. Um, one thing that did kind of, well, before we get to that part, I, I want to talk a bit about the trolls in the uh, opening, essentially. It was the, the very beginning of the movie. Uh, they race Anna to the trolls in order to save her. And that scene, to me, was just a hot mess. I mean, it, it, looked, it was a disaster, in my opinion. And I rewatched the film last night. And what struck me was that the uh, grandfather troll when he's talking to Elsa about her powers, says, you, your powers are only going to grow, but there's also going to be this horrific danger. And when he's saying that there's horrific danger, there's like these big explosions in the sky and all this red, and it's like super dramatic. And then he's like, uh, you shouldn't be afraid though, because if you're afraid, you're not going to be able to control it. Well, you just scared the crap out of this little girl. She's like 10 years old and you're... So what were you doing? I don't, I, it just boggles my mind that he would 
introduce her powers in this way, saying they're super dangerous and they're scary, but don't be afraid because you shouldn't be afraid. And it, uh, it's just, it was really difficult to watch. Yeah, that, I, I think the whole thing is just a problem with just who the trolls are. And I mean, here are people that apparently know what this is. They are like the, the experts on this thing, but they don't tell us something. And also like the rules they do tell us, like the thing with the heart and the, the head. It, it, it's not like, it's not really believable. And I think that's kind of interesting because in, in Wreck-It Ralph, they do a lot of rule telling too. They just tell you stuff. Um, and you believe it, but here I felt like you, this is an opportunity that they missed to give her magical powers like any dimension, um, and also how the how the how the parents react to it is really strange that they just lock her up. I mean, they 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 was never shown like them talking about it or what they could do. They felt. Like it felt like the solution to them, but to to make them more human, they should like I don't know talk about it or try to find somebody who could teach her, which they already kind of have. If the trolls knows what that is, why don't they become the teacher to her? I I I don't know. Yeah, the parents were another very strange bit of that movie. It was like they were necessary, so they put them in the film but they weren't so necessary that they wanted to have them actually be characters because all he got out of them was hey you shouldn't uh you shouldn't be yourself and hide away in this tower here which is a great idea okay we're gonna go off and die now but it, I, I mean it, it could have been great like the father could have been like this guy scared that his reputation would be ruined if he has a weird princess that that could have been very intense. That could have been like an inner struggle of him somehow, and and yeah. And then he he kind of loves her, but he doesn't know how to deal with the situation. That would have been great stuff. And it's just they don't talk about it once. And I understand, you know, they only have so much film uh, role, you know, to to make. But that seems like a really important part that they could have spent a little more time on. So I guess as filmmakers, if we wanted to go back and redo it a different way, uh, maybe we have a couple scenes, just really brief scenes, where the dad is trying to help her learn to control her powers. You know, there may be target practice or something, I don't know, but, or, or they go back to the trolls and the trolls are showing her, okay, this is how you do this or, or whatever the case might be. And then that lends a little more to you know an actual character you know two characters interacting and things instead of just okay we're going to show this scene with a dad where he gives her gloves and says conceal don't feel which is our theme for the rest of the movie okay he, he can go off and be out of the picture now seemed very strange also uh while we're on the subject of the parents why was anna also then locked in the castle for her whole life like i could understand you want to keep elsa under wraps or something but Apparently, if we're led to believe with the coronation, she's never been outside the walls her whole yeah. life, which didn't make any sense to me. How, and, and, and then she just goes off and nobody seems to say anything about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is also kind of weird of how she behaves when she is out. Like, I mean, sure, she thinks, she sings about how she's never been outside and stuff, but she, I don't know, she falls in love with this guy as first action. That, mm. That's she seems that's very well socially adjusted, despite the fact that she's never had any practice being socially yeah. adjusted. Yeah. Uh, and, and speaking on that, one other thing that struck me was they live in a palace with a lot of servants and things. And yeah. uh, Elsa and Anna are both very educated by the you know point where the coronation comes up, which means they had to have had a teacher, which means that there was some sort of human interaction between Anna and another person. It wasn't like Anna really was just roaming the halls all by herself. Now, she may not have had another child to interact with, but she did have other human interaction. And we're led to believe in the film that she's all alone in this castle all the time. But then when you see like the coronation, there are guards everywhere, there are servants everywhere, there are people all over the place. So either they just showed up for the coronation, which doesn't make a lot of sense, or 
she did have people. Before we go into too far into the movie, I think what we also need to talk about is um, the very beginning where Elsa and Anna were playing together. Um, I feel like you're you're they are violating a storytelling rule. Like you you before you break a status quo, you need to really tell it. You you need to say, okay, this is normal. You need to give it a time to become. Uh, this is normal state in the in the viewer's mind. Uh, and then maybe something similar happens. They play again, and then the incident happens. But it, it just happens like the first time we were introduced to it. We introduced to it, and then immediately something goes wrong. And this is this is too fast. And it also takes away from their relationship, from how close they are, because you know they, they don't get much time to be so close to uh, have this this relationship that pulls them together years later again absolutely yeah there's the whole their sisters thing you know so that has some weight but uh, if you figure in the opening scene anna is maybe what eight or so the first you know three or four years of her life she's really not gonna be that close with elsa because she's a baby and then so she only has like four years to be super close and then suddenly they're not close for the next what 10 15 years but the the norm as you said seems to be that early day it, it doesn't really line up very well yeah yeah and i mean the, the it was such a long time that elsa was locked away and for some reason anna like i don't know i feel like if someone would always push you away even if it is your sister like after five years you would say well okay I, I don't try it anymore. I don't care for you that much anymore. I try to get my own life on track. But then when she comes out, they're suddenly super close again and she wants to rescue her, although they just, you know, spent what, like five minutes together? And yeah, it's just, it's super accelerated. It seems like a lot of the movie was just really accelerated. They just, they wanted to cram as much as they could into the time that they had, so they just they just went for it and they left out all of the times that, like, the audience needs time to breathe, and there wasn't a lot of breathing room, especially in the early goings of this movie. It was just, okay, they're sisters, they play together, Anna's injured, they go see the trolls, God conceal, not feel, parents are dead, coronation day, okay, now we can start the movie. And it, <laughs> that's a lot to take in as an audience uh, in such a short amount of time. Which I understand you need that setup, but I would have loved to see a little bit longer to deal with that instead of it just rushing right to adulthood, essentially. I, it, it reminds me of a lot of earlier Disney films like Fox and the Hound. Can you imagine if Fox and the Hound, they had like two minutes to be friends, and then we were expected that when they're older and they're chasing each other, they had some relationship? It wouldn't have worked at all. Yeah. I, I don't want to go super negative all the time, so I wanted to talk about Olaf for a minute because uh, I thought that they did an amazing job with Olaf. Yeah. Like, uh, just tremendous. It is Everything about why I love animation was in Olaf. He was funny, the timing was brilliant, the acting was brilliant, the, the voice work was just genius. Everything came together so beautifully with him, from the, the summer song to just every scene where he had this just wonder about him. Uh, I just thought that they really did a great job with him. And I think yeah. maybe a lot of people loved Frozen as much as they did, not only because of the connection between sisters and people could connect to that, but Olaf, I mean, he just brought so much to the movie. If you took him out of this, you would have the same story, but you wouldn't have the same movie. You know what I mean? Yeah, but, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I totally agree. Like, for me, it also was the best part of the movie which kind of makes you wonder how well he fits into that movie because everything else is so yeah more serious and not yet keeping to its rules and then you have this cartoon character and I mean they do that awesomely well so I don't mind <laughs> but it's uh, another thing about consistency uh, you almost needed another Olaf like character I guess so that there was a little more of that throughout the movie. Tried that with the reindeer, but... Yeah, they did. Every once in a while, but 
they didn't like take him far enough except sometimes honestly for for Sven it was like whatever they needed him to be in that moment that's what he would be he'd either be totally a normal reindeer or then he'd be a reindeer that kind of had human elements or then he'd be almost a human reindeer and and it was just whatever needed to be done at the time there wasn't a lot of consistency with Sven and that was a shame because I think that there were sparks of something great there but just never quite took hold and then another thing I feel like that Olaf reveals in this film is how like his voice fits perfectly but I think like Elsa's voice kind of feels disconnected from her pretty Disney model because the voice is so strong like it's a character voice you could you you could close your eyes and imagine a character who sings let it go and sadly she wouldn't look like Elsa she would look a lot stronger not so Barbie like I don't know no I totally agree that is that's a great point uh, it just did not fit at all like it just didn't work <laughs> Like the animation was great at places, the voice acting was great at places, the, the model is appealing. <laughs> I, I don't understand how all those mo uh, this areas for themselves are done so perfectly and then you put them together and they don't fit together. Yeah, it's just, it's something that we should totally keep in mind, you know, again, as animators and filmmakers, that when you have a particular voice, it needs the character that belongs to that voice. Because if you have somebody who just shouldn't sound like that, uh, one thing that jumps out in my mind, I don't know if you've seen Singing in the Rain, uh, old musical. In that mm -hmm. film, uh, the, the lead actress during this silent era of films has this horrible grating voice, and nobody expects her to have this voice. So the whole, the whole movie is based around the fact that the voice doesn't fit with this, this lovely lady. And, um, and it, it felt like that. It was like, here's Elsa who doesn't look like she should have that sort of ability to... Uh, and, and I also felt that the age thing was a little off. You know, some people who are older can pull off a young character, but I feel like the maturity in uh, the voice actress's voice, just, it didn't come through with Elsa, because she was, like you said, very Barbie, very princessy, uh, young looking. They needed to add a little more maturity to her, in my opinion. Yeah. So. Uh, one thing I noticed was that there was a lot of inconsistency of what snow stuck to in the movie, and that's not something that you would really care about as a normal film goer, but that's something that we need to remember because those sort of inconsistencies will continuously build up in the audience's mind even if they're not really fully aware of it. So for example, Kristoff, anytime he was near snow, his whole hair would just totally be covered in snow, whereas Anna she would be in the same situations as him, but she'd never have a drop of snow on her. And it was, it was very strange. And then uh, the same for Sven. Sven never, well, rarely had any snow on him. But Kristoff would always be head to toe in snow. And it was like, why is it not sticking at all to the reindeer? <laughs> so that seemed pretty strange to me. But again, I, I feel like I'm nitpicking, but these are the things that we need to remember while we're doing these, these films. We need to remember consistency, consistency, consistency. You know, you build this world and then you follow the rules that you've set for the world. And I think yeah. that's another thing that we've talked about previously and other things is that whole world rules. Um, I, I know that you had mentioned with the, the kind of world rules around magic. Do you want to talk about that a, a bit? Oh, yeah. Um, it feels like, I mean, the trolls are there to explain the magic a little bit to us but we don't really feel like that there's, again, a consistent uh, a consistent magic world around them. Like, um, the, the trolls say, like, what, is it a curse? Or uh, was she born that way? And you think, like, oh, this is getting interesting. There is, like, a whole magical world. This happens all the time, and there are curses, and there are people born with magic powers. And then, okay, tell me more about that. And then there is not really more about that and and the characters don't really react consistent to it like her magic powers are like this big threat that nobody uh expects and yet everybody is okay with like the parents are okay with the trolls for, for once they know that the trolls exist 
actually that didn't occur to me yet that's also pretty weird but yeah like you don't feel like there's there's a consistent world around it and um on record ralph they did it pretty amazing they even managed to do that with like a couple of worlds and you believe the rules there because the characters know the rules and the characters only talk about the rules so much because they can only tell another character what this character doesn't know about the world it's it's not like now we tell you about how this world works there's magic and there's this that that's not what i want that's probably what a fantasy book would do and that is often far too much but like from how the character within those worlds behave you get how those worlds are and in frozen the hints that you get in every direction just don't line up to a clear picture and i think that that that's also something that you you feel um and that can throw you out of the movie yeah Let's talk about the uh, twist at the end of the movie regarding a villain that wasn't a villain for the entire rest of the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so, when you have a villain who is a hidden villain, it is extremely important from a storytelling perspective that you put in hints that maybe they aren't everything that they appear to be. Unfortunately, there was nothing with Hans. I specifically, specifically went through this movie and any scene that he was in, I just watched him. I didn't watch anything else. I just watched his face. I watched his actions and everything about him. And I analyzed his dialogue and there was nothing to indicate that he was anything but genuine. Like the whole time. And I have a funny feeling that the animators, when they animated him, they animated him genuine. Like, the, the internal emotion that was coming out of him was genuine, whatever his character was for the first most of the movie. And then they just turned a light switch and he was... That was actually setting up a great conflict, because for the first time in a Disney film, a princess really had to choose, or really had the choice between two great guys, and that's how reality is. It's not black and white, you have problems like that. That's a great thing. And during the movie, the first time I saw it, I was genuinely excited as a viewer that, that Disney was finally going to be tackling something like this. It was like, wow, there's no problem with either of them. So she's going to have a situation where at the end of the movie, she's going to stand there between the two of them and have to make a decision. Do you go with the guy you just met and you said you were already going to marry? Or do you let him down because he clearly cares about you? And I was like, oh, this is going to be a great moment. And then when the Hans moment happened, when he totally turned, I was just pissed. I was like, you just destroyed everything. Why did you do that? Yeah, yeah. And, and kind of the villain who was left, namely Elsa's fear, was also a great thing. Like having a, an emotion as a villain, having an internal conflict as the antagonist, which works, which you, you can make that work was a great new thing and then yeah dis disappointed it was definitely disappointing the way they handled that aspect of it. but i don't know i mean i guess i don't know i think <laughs> if you're gonna go that route you need to foreshadow it a little bit otherwise just go for it i felt like a lot of this movie they didn't they they wanted to do something different but then they didn't jump in with both feet yeah. they, they were like no we still have to, and the other thing um, we had talked about at a different point is uh, the ending with the sister love being the true uh, love act. Yeah, that was brilliant, right? Yeah, that was there was an awesome twist. In uh, in this time, like the storytelling worked perfectly. Like they were getting us on this. Uh, it's about true love between prince and princess track, and we, we the audience is completely expecting that it is about that, and then they they have the twist that is love between sister, which is completely belie believable. This time there's some consistency in here, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it 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 is the. Th the, the theme of the movie um, but then in the wrap up they still try to wrap it up like a normal Disney film like Prince and Princess get together and it's just 
not necessary because that was not the topic of the movie. The topic of the movie was between the sisters. Yeah. Totally agree. And, uh, you know, again, approaching it from that filmmaking aspect, a way that you could have implied that Anna and Kristoff were going to end up together is during the final scene where they're talking about the sled and Kristoff is like, I could kiss you, and then it gets very awkward. If you just had Anna give him a peck on the cheek and, you know, he smiles, then there's that, oh, this is going to turn into something. And you've, you've told the audience enough. You don't have to go full-on lip kiss after that moment because it kind of detracts from the whole sister thing that was just happening. And it kind of just puts her right back in the situation she was with the Hans. Like, you just knew this guy for two days instead of one day. Maybe slow it down a little bit. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, uh, there's so much more to talk about. <laughs> but it, it can only go on so long. Um, one last thing that I want to talk about before we recap everything that we've learned today um, is just the timing of the film uh, from a sense of real-time action. If you actually analyze what's going on in, in the time frame of the film, it doesn't really logically make any sort of sense. Um, the coronation happens, and then Elsa runs off into the mountains late at night. She gets to the top of the northern mountain where she builds her castle, and then builds her castle, and dawn happens right then. But then we cut to a scene where it's still nighttime, and Anna is meeting Kristoff. And so, you know, we have to, we're suddenly pulled out of the movie, if you really look at it, and say, okay, wait, so is this happening simultaneously while Elsa's building her castle? Because I'm a bit confused here. And then another aspect, or another time that happened in the film was at the end. Elsa breaks out of prison. Uh, she destroys the wall of the castle with ice and she breaks out and she runs. She just runs. And then there's a, a long scene between Olaf and Anna, um, a very touching emotional scene that really needed to be there. And then the two of them escape the castle, which is being frozen and destroyed. And then Anna is super uh, frail at this point in the film. And so she's stumbling along trying to find Kristoff. And suddenly she's next to Elsa. She's like 10 feet away from her. When logically 20 minutes have passed and, uh, and Elsa was just running. So it, it's like if you zoomed out and you looked at the scene from above and you watched like a little dotted line like in Emperor's New Groove where they went, Elsa would have had to literally be doing laps and just walking around in circles for 20 <laughs> minutes. And it made yeah. no, no real sense. And then, of course, Hans appears uh, just in front of Elsa when you would think that every guard in the kingdom would be after her at that point in the movie, but apparently they're not. It's just Hans. And, and you know, you can get away with stuff like that, but I just felt that it was really... It just it pulled me out of it, and I was like, why is Elsa suddenly right next to... Anna next to the castle when she left a long time ago. She thought her sister was dead, so there's no reason for her to go back to the castle, right? It, mm -hmm. it just, it was very strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, or, or maybe, actually at that point she didn't think her sister was dead. She was just running for her life. So... Yeah. She would be extra far away. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm really not sure what happened there, but... At any rate, let's, uh, let's pull it all together and, and talk about what we learned. Uh, what are some things that we can pull from all of this analysis going forward with our own films? Consistency! <laughs> Amen. Consistency is number one. You build world rules and then you stick to those world rules. And if you're going to break a world rule, then you need to have a very good reason for breaking that world rule. And because you're, you're going to jar the audience because you've already set it up that way. So consistency is definitely number one. <laughs> Uh, I think number two would be foreshadowing. If you're yeah. going to have a villain, um, make sure that that villain... The, the audience has an inkling that maybe it, it is a villain. Because yeah. out of left field, it just... And even if not, they did not even, like, they met on complete accident. Like, if it, that what was at least set up, like, it was ceremonial that they are introduced or something like that, so that she, he actually could have a plan. That would have been something. Well, they, yeah. do, they do touch on that a little bit in the film. He says, uh, my original plan was to go after Elsa and then kill her, but then you came along and you were so desperate. 
And so you start, you know, that that makes sense. But the, the problem, the reason that that explanation doesn't really work is that in the first scene when they first meet, uh, they fall into the boat and then El uh, Anna realizes, oh, I have to get back for the coronation. I have to go. So she takes off running. And then Hans is by himself, all alone. There's nobody there to observe him. And he smiles in this very endearing way. Yeah, true. After her. So either he's playing to an audience that doesn't exist because there's no one around him, or he really did care for her in that moment. So, you know, yeah, even yeah, that, yeah. that meeting, it seemed to, it just, it was clearly a trick. Like the filmmakers tricked the audience. And I really don't agree with that. Decision. That's lying. That's lying to the audience. Yeah. So yeah, if there's another, if there's another one of those, and we're on number three here, don't lie to your audience. You know, you can, you can like pull the wool over their eyes a little bit. You can like, like we were talking with, the the writers set it up that oh, it's about true love between prince and princess, true love, prince and princess, and then they they were like oh, I tricked you, and that's okay because you set up all the other stuff. But you can't straight out lie to the audience. The thing about twists is, and foreshadowing and all that stuff, you need to make possibilities of your movie to go in that direction, that direction, that direction. Uh, and a good twist is a possi possibility that was logical and possible, but that was not in your audience's mind. And only after it happens, you're like, oh yeah, I see all this what builds up to that. So, yeah, that's the thing about twists. And then with the Hans thing, uh, you, you, you'd mentioned that you were talking to Ed Hook's legendary acting teacher, and, and he said the audience, uh, a lot of the audience, believed that they missed something with Hans. So they, they thought it was their fault that they didn't know why this was happening. And I think that's a great point. I mean, that guy knows what he's talking about. So uh, I think that you know those things are things that we can really learn. Oh, and then if we could add another one, it would be Olaf and how delightful he was. Um, and just when you go into making your own films, if you can capture a little bit of the magic that's in Olaf, then you're set because you could build a world around Olaf. He was brilliant. Yeah. So that's all I have. Anything you want to wrap up with? No, that's, that's it. All right, well, uh, for the audience out there, thanks for watching, and we hope that we've inspired you to take a closer look at maybe Frozen and other films that you uh, like and dislike, and look at uh, really what makes them them, so that you can take it a step further with your own films and make something that we all really want to see and maybe goes on to make $2 billion or whatever Frozen is at now. Uh, yeah. This has been... Oh, yep. Yeah, definitely don't be afraid to, to nitpick or something like you know even if it's something that everybody loves you know everything can be improved um, and you can always pick up what you liked and what you don't like of, out of any film and uh, yeah it's just it's just part of our job to analyze stuff like that so we can do it right when we build our own stuff indeed and um, for both filmmakers and just moviegoers alike Remember that when people analyze something, it doesn't detract from the fact that you like it. You, you know, Frozen, if you adored Frozen as your favorite film ever, that's great. I mean, that's a really good thing. We want people to love these films. That doesn't mean it's perfect, and it doesn't mean that you're imperfect because somebody found a flaw in the thing you loved. Um, it's just analysis, and that's okay to do. That's a good point. So for Animator Island, this is JK and Ferdinand. Um, please feel free to like, share, subscribe, and absolutely join us in the comments. Um, what did you love about Frozen? What were some other things that you thought could have been improved? We really want to hear your opinions on it, and hopefully then we can all have a great discussion. Yeah, wonderful. All right, we'll see you next Bye. time.